All right, I'm, I want to thank Ed, uh, first off, for having me here. It's been a long time. I uh, used to give some talks over here a long time ago, about five or six years ago, and uh, called up and talked about the Caduceus Society and, and getting these talks ramped up again. And uh, I'm just glad to, glad to be here, excited to see you guys again, and, and uh, thanks again, Ed, for having me. Um, my talk here is, is going to be about the shoulder and the shoulder uh, and, and how it relates to you guys. Um, and what I think, if you're going to walk away from anything from this, these talks or these series of talks, it's to at least understand you know, the basic anatomy of the shoulder. And number two, uh, how to do a basic exam of the shoulder. And number three, know when and, and, you know, to refer the patient out. I mean, when, is, when do you need to actually get a little bit of help or even get a, a second opinion? And uh, I've had uh, patients come over to me from other doctors for second opinions, and I'm happy to look at them and give them my opinion on what's going on and return them back or what, whatever needs to be done. But, but I think if you can walk away with those three things, then we've uh, made this a successful uh, symposium for you guys. Uh, but real quick, uh, before we get started, about myself, I'm with the Fondren Orthopedic Group, and, uh, and um, I've been uh, practicing uh, sports medicine and uh, general orthopedics here in, in Houston area, and Sugarland area for now about seven years. I uh, trained at Baylor down the street and uh, did my uh, sports medicine fellowship um, at the University of Miami and uh, spent some time with the Hurricanes and then I went over and spent uh, some time with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, so there will be some slides in here from my Miami uh, Buccaneer days, but, uh, but a lot of this is, is going to be sports related and, uh, and some of it will be degenerative changes and arthritic, but most of it's going to be sports related. So anyway, upper extremity injuries, uh, like I said before, we're going to go over the, uh, the anatomy a little bit, we'll talk about some common injuries. This actually, I have the elbow in here as well. If we have enough time, we'll go into the elbow. If you guys are interested in learning anything about the elbow or a little bit about the elbow, I'd be happy to go through that as well, just because it is part of this talk, but we'll see how we're doing on time. So basic anatomy here, and I'm sure this is pretty pretty basic for you guys, but I just wanted to go over it again just to kind of point out some of the main uh, structures you want to look at when you're evaluating the shoulder. You know, the sternoclavicular joint, you start at the chest plate, you kind of work lateral, you know, clavicle, chromoclavicular joint, glenohumeral joint, and humeral head, greater two, greater or lesser tubercles, vesicle groove, and this is the deltoid tuberosity with the deltoid inserts, and then of course the scapula. And these are the main structures that you want to be evaluating from a bony aspect. When you're getting x-rays, and uh, this is key, um, when I see patients, sometimes they'll come in from other docs or other facilities, and they'll have one view here, which is an AP view of the shoulder, and then they may have an internal or an external view of the shoulder, like internally rotated or externally rotated. That's great if you're looking for a tuberosity fracture, but it's not going to tell you if that shoulder is located or you know, where that shoulder is in space and time. This could be actually anterior, it could be posterior. So you've got to get one of these two views, at least one of these two views. A lot of patients will be able to lift their arm up to get an axillary lateral if they're really in a lot of pain. So a scapular Y is a good uh, option here. And that's just having them sitting and tilting their body. So this shows you that the shoulder is located and it's not dislocated because you see the circle here, the humeral head, and you see another circle in the middle, that's a glenoid. So you know they're in alignment right there. This tells you that uh, you're not dislocated because there's a humeral head, here's the glenoid. Like I mentioned before, this is like your, this is your golf ball, this is your golf tee. So when you think of shoulder, well, that shoulder, that's how you, how you think about it. Especially if you think about bony defects in the glenoid, like I mentioned before, that golf tee and the, the golf ball rolling off the golf tee. Um, so those are just some uh, something to think about when you're getting x-rays. You want at least two of these views here, two of these three views. Soft tissue anatomy, uh, once it's, like I said, I apologize if this is redundant, but, um, but this is kind of key. Uh, ligaments are bone attachment to bone, but these are things that you want to look at when you're actually palpating and looking at a patient, and what you want to be thinking about, what might be injured. Uh, the core clavicular ligaments, uh, basically coracoid to the clavicle uh, up here, and these are the ligaments that are injured usually in AC joint dislocations that Adam re referred to before. And, uh, and, and you can usually, if you obviously have a high riding uh, 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 clavicle, more likely these are either stretched or injured. Uh, there's the trapezoid and the colonoid ligaments. These are the two over here. Uh, the glenohumeral ligaments, which go from the glenoid to the humerus here, that account for your stability in the shoulder joint. Uh, in patients that have Ehlers Danlos or Morphan syndrome, those ligaments are all going to be loose, so that's why the shoulder is going to be you know, 
popping in and out of the joint because of laxity within these ligaments. Or if you have a patient that has adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder, these ligaments thicken up and get inflamed and irritated and they cause an internal rotation or external rotation, a lack of internal or external rotation. Uh, bicep tendon, as well as in the front of the shoulder, dives in deep and inserts at the top of the glenoid here. And then the glenoid labrum, which is a little bumper around the glenoid here, okay? So <coughs> just some basic anatomy here, things to be thinking about. This is just some dissections that we, we did. We got some pictures of here. This is the glenoid here, just a straight on shot here. This is the biceps inserted here at 12 o'clock in the glenoid. This is what Adam was showing earlier. This is a slap tear. Uh, this is, I've described this probably as a type two slap tear, which actually ripped off of the glenoid. Bone is here, labrum is here. And the patient or the forearm arcs that rotates their arm backwards and, the, and the, the cocking motion and throwing this peels back. It's called a peel back sign. We do this arthroscopically when we're looking at a patient to evaluate them if they do have a slap tear put their arm back like they're in a throwing position. If this peels back and pops over that rim of bone there, that's a positive sign. Those we will fix, and we actually fix those with a couple of anchors and some sutures, and that pulls it down to actually hold the bone and let it heal. Now, you can have type one tears, which is a little flap off of here, and, uh, and that's what Adam had mentioned before. The type one type of slap tears can cause uh, some pain and sometimes some popping sensation as well. When you get into type three, four, five, six, and seven, there's actually that many types of slap tears out there. That depends on where the tears are. It could be the front of the labrum, it could be up and on the biceps, it could be the back of the labrum. But uh, either way, those are all you know, those are all mechanical or contribute to mechanical symptoms in the shoulder. So the patient comes in and they're popping and clicking, and it's a lot of times it's due to these flaps or tears along this area. Um, when you have a dislocation, obviously this is the uh, this is the front of the shoulder right here. This is the coracoid here. So this is the labrum that actually is ripped off, uh, and this is where the anterior inferior dislocation occurs here. This is just basically looking at the biceps. This is the CA ligament that I mentioned before. When I'm looking at this arthroscopically, this is the arc here. So this is the rotator cuff all around here. This is supraspinatus right here. So when this arm comes out, the abduction and external rotation. You know, this can actually pinch over here, okay? And, uh, and that's called, what's called impingement. Uh, and sometimes you can get some bony spur formations in this uh, CA ligament here that actually causes an impingement on that tendon. Now sometimes this ligament looks pristine and clean and intact and there's no evidence of degeneration or anything like that. And if that's the case, you leave it alone. But if it is damaged or partially torn, we'll actually remove the portion of that ligament and actually smooth down the bone spur underneath it. So this is where you're gonna see the bone spurs, right in that little space right there. Muscles, uh, muscle tendon units, this is the rotator cuff, uh, basically. You start with the deltoid, which is the large uh, muscle on the outside of the shoulder, then you go in the rotator cuff, and it sits, S-I-T-S, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Adam went over that as well with you guys. It's just basic anatomy regarding the shoulder. Um, this is just looking at it anatomically. Uh, a cadaver dissection here. This is a nice picture here of the coracoid. This is what we actually, when I talked about that ladder J procedure, where we have a shoulder that's dislocating constantly anteriorly because of a bone defect in the glenoid down here. We cut this bone here, the coracoid, move it down here, and actually screw it down here to the inferior aspect of the glenoid give them a bone block so the shoulder doesn't dislocate, okay? This is the subscapularis tendon up here, up front, coming down over. The biceps tendon's over here, so the subscap actually is, is kind of covering that area over there, okay? So that's why when uh, Adam, mentioned, Adam mentioned before, the, the snapping uh, uh, biceps, usually you see a snapping, dislocating biceps when your subscapularis is detached, because the subscapularis is also kind of on one side of the bicep, so it kind of keeps that biceps from snapping over, and when it's detached, that biceps will slide over into this region where the subscapularis is. This is the supraspinatus up top, and then behind, you've got infraspinatus and teres minor right over here. Um, once again, the clavicle and the acromion back here. This is the ligaments, the uh, CA ligaments, uh, coracoacromial ligaments over here and the coracoclavicular ligaments over here. They both stabilize this whole structure here. So basically, if you have an attachment of the ligament here between the chromioclavicular joint and the ligaments here between the coracoclavicular joint here, 
you essentially almost have a floating shoulder because that that scapula now is kind of floating on its own. There's not really a lot holding that scapula to the thoracic body other than the musculature here. So if you do have a patient that has these chronic AC joint dislocations where their clavicles popping up like that, they're gonna get a lot of fatigue of these muscles down here because the muscles are overworking trying to keep that shoulder in place. So it's important that these guys are really working on strengthening that arm, doing their rotator cuff muscular exercises to help balance out the shoulder. Otherwise, sometimes this can lead to pain, and if it does lead to pain, depending on how unstable they are, we'll actually go in there and reconstruct these ligaments to actually stabilize their uh, shoulder. MRI correlations, you guys have gone through this already. Um, so. As far as assessment here, okay, when you first see the patient walk into your office, you know, what are the things you want to be looking at? You know, what is the cause of the pain? Did they just wake up one morning and just have pain all of a sudden? Or did they were they in a car wreck? Uh, did they fall down on an outstretched extremity? What's the mechanism of injury? Have they had a previous history of problems with the shoulder? shoulder location, duration, intensity of pain? Uh, having any crepitus, numbness, distortion in temperature? Weakness or fatigue in the shoulder? What gives them relief? I mean, do they feel pain worse at night when they're sleeping? What gives them relief? Do they feel better when they hold their arm up against their body? Um, if they have, do they have any numbness or tingling involved? Those are all things that you want to be running through your your differentials, or at least your, your uh, diagnostic processes to run through a number of differentials to see what's going on. So then you just look at the patient. You know, just have the patient walk in, just, uh, just have them just uh, take their shirt or uh, at least uh, expose their shoulders so you can look at their shoulders and look for symmetry across the shoulders. Uh, are they kind of uh, protecting one side? Are they riding, uh, raising one side over the other? Uh, the position and shape of the clavicle, like I mentioned before, do they have a dislocation of the clavicle? Uh, the acromion process, is it painful over the acromion? Do you feel any crepitus? Crepitus would indicate some soft tissue swelling, sometimes can indicate a fracture in this area. Uh, biceps and deltoid symmetry. Sometimes you may be thinking that this guy's got a rotator cuff problem, they've got complete asymmetry and atrophy on one side, but then it's a neck issue. It's like a, it's, it's a disc or a spur. Postural assessment, kyphosis, lordosis, look at the shoulders. Position of the head and the arm, are they tilting their head to one side and, and they got spasm on this side? Maybe it's not the shoulder, maybe it's something else going within the sternocleidomastoids in the neck. Scapular elevation symmetry, this is something that often gets, doesn't get looked at by a lot of uh, docs. Scapular protraction of winging. When you're watching them look at the, you're looking at the physical exam like Adam showed you earlier, raising the arms up and down out to the side, look at their backs too, look at their scapulas, their scapula winging out, is it protruding? Because that means that, once again, there's an imbalance in the musculature, and you're gonna have to focus on the muscles between the scapula and the thoracic ribs, okay? As well as the rotator cuff. So you can't hone in and, and, uh, and just focus on one thing. You gotta be thinking holistically here, okay? So um, then you go into actual uh, touching the patient, evaluating the patient. Bony palpation is key. These are the areas that you wanna focus on, start, Medially, right here at the sternoclavicular joint, work your way laterally. Start the sternoclavicular joint at the rib, uh, or the chest plate, clavicle, acromioclavicular joint, the coracoid in the front of the shoulder, the chromium, the humeral head, the greater and lesser tuberosities, the bicipital groove. Adam described that great test, the crass test, and actually, I've been doing that for a while. I didn't know it was actually called the crass test, but. I do that with uh, when you're doing an ultrasound evaluation, but that's a great way to expose that supraspinatus because it really raises it in front of you and you can actually palpate it directly. When I was, was in Miami, the doctor, Dr. Uribe, who I the trained with, who's the doctor at the, at the dolphins and the, uh, the hurricanes, he would have patients come in and do that exact same test, but we'd actually palpate. If you have a thin enough patient, you can actually palpate a rotator cuff tear in some of these patients, especially if it's a big tear. Um, so once again, I mentioned uh, scapular vertebral border. Important, really look at your scapula. I mean, more and more studies are talking about when it comes to shoulder pain, you gotta look at the scapula. You gotta look at the scapula thoracic um, you know, uh, movement across the shoulder joint because if that's in balance, it's gonna throw the kinetics completely off of the shoulder and they're gonna be just predisposing themselves as, to injury and pain. Soft tissues now. So. Um, once again, going down to, down to the uh, soft tissues like the rotator cuff, bursa, these are things you want to be thinking about again. Biceps, CA ligament, 
This is kind of everything that we've already talked about. Once again, look for atrophy, look for asymmetry, look at strength, okay? Uh, because, uh, like I mentioned before, you could be dealing with what you think is a rotator cuff, maybe a parsonage turner or a brachial plexopathy, which is inflammation of the nerves. And this may be something that's not going to get any better with just completely just trying to work out and do the, do the exercises. Maybe this is something that maybe needs further workup, okay? So uh, just things to think about here, okay? So first thing you do, okay, and you guys all should be really good at the cervical spine evaluation. So this is the first thing I do with every single one of my patients. I want to make sure that I'm dealing with a shoulder issue. Start with the neck, okay, and work your way out to the shoulder as well. Work a range of motion. Look at the lateral bend. Do that be numbness and tingling down the arm when they tilt their head one side or the other? Spurling sign, put direct pressure down on the, the, the head and neck, and do they have a, uh, symptoms of uh, paresthesias or numbness in their arms? Uh, palpate the neck. Do they have paraspinal spasm? Are they tender along the facets or the tender along the spinous processes? Once I've ruled this out, and I know it's not, so, not anything cervical, then I move on to the shoulder. Range of motion, manual most motor testing. Um, range of motion is key, like Adam mentioned, you look at, look at symmetry, make sure both arms. One patient, some patients may not have full range of motion in both arms, but you just want to make sure that they're symmetric. Instability, you want to make sure that they're not popping out of joint. Now that being said, you don't want to go have them show up in your clinic and pop them out of joint, okay? You want to make sure that you can recognize it before it happens. So if a patient comes in to you and say, hey, doc, you know, my shoulder pops out three or four times a month, I have pain, and you evaluate them and you put them in that abduction external rotation, it may very well just pop out on you in the clinic and you're going to find yourself having to reduce it in the clinic, which is not going to be fun. So you just want to make sure that you say, okay, well, you know, why don't you see, does it hurt when you go in this position here just a little bit? Don't push them all the way. If they are apprehensive, that's an apprehensive sign right there. So just stop. Don't push them any further than that, okay? So that's a provocative test. That means you're provo provoking the, the uh, symptoms, okay? Good neurovascular exam, okay? Make sure they got good, good blood flow, good sensation. Uh, one thing we see uh, occasionally is thoracic outlet syndrome. Patients come in, you know, my hand goes numb when I go in this position here. Uh, what's going on? Well, they lift their, they do what's called an Adson test, lift the arm up, turn their head, the fingers turn blanch, and they, you, you get a diminish in your pulse. That actually means that the thoracic outlet is closing up and actually squeezing the nerves and vessels up in this area. And that can actually uh, you know, be addressed with really actually just stretching and therapy. But you've got to be able to recognize these things, okay, and just call it as they are. Um, okay, so these are just some basic exams. Um, as far as stability is concerned, if you're worried about dislocating somebody in this position, particularly the abduction external position, sometimes you can just assess stability just by having them sit upright or laying down and just shucking the shoulder, okay, back and forth. Uh, this is where you abduct and externally rotate, where you just got to be careful because sometimes they'll actually pop out on you if they are unstable. This is a sulcus test where you actually just pull longitudinal traction down the arm. If you feel a divot here between the acromion and the tuberosity, and you actually feel it, uh, that means that they're pretty lax. Okay, that's a positive sulcus test. A clunk test is actually when they actually clunk and pop out of joint. I wouldn't I would recommend that necessarily. Um, apprehension tests, like I mentioned before, this is the, the position that they are apprehensive in. That means that they are prone for an instability or they may have some anterior labral symptoms. Posterior instability apprehension tests that bring our arm across the shoulder and basically shucking posteriorly and feeling for any instability. Relocation test is basically where you use external rotation and anterior pressure to see if they have a decrease in their symptoms. So you put them in this position but you're putting pressure on the front of their shoulder while they're laying down, seeing if they feel better, and then you remove their the pressure, and then they feel like their symptoms come back. That is a positive relocation test. That means that they have instability in the front of the shoulder. Shoulder impingement, once again, this is like what Adam mentioned before. These are just the basic tests that we do. Um, Nears test, Hawkins test, to, to determine the impingement, used to assess impingement or soft tissue structures. Raising the arm above their head, have them lean to the side. This actually brings the uh, rotator cuff near the acromion. Um, sometimes you can actually have them reach across their body and uh, they'll feel pain anteriorly or posteriorly in the shoulder. That's also sometimes indicative of some biceps uh, pathology as well. 
Uh, the drop arm test, as Adam mentioned before, have the arm out to the side. And I usually have them, you know, you can lift the arm, help them up, lift the arm up to 90 degrees and then have them lower the arm. If they're unable to hold the arm up and it just drops, that's a positive drop arm sign, okay? So if they're able to slowly lower their arm, then they, that's a, that's, that means that the tendon's intact. Uh, and they don't have, at least they don't have a massive tear, right? Um, empty can test, this is good. This is for supraspinatus pathology. Uh, basically 90 degrees and drop your thumbs down to the, the, the floor. That's why it's called the empty can, because you've got emptying a can. And uh, downward pressures applied and weakness and pain are assessed bilaterally, and that'll actually indicate if you have any kind of uh, pain in the supraspinatus region, indicating a rotator cuff pathology. Once again, here's, uh, here's the scapula winging I'm talking about. So I, I have patients after I've evaluated them completely in the front as far as range of motion strength is concerned, I'll have them do a push up on the wall, or actually lean up against the wall put their arms up against the wall, and sometimes these are pretty obvious. The scapula just wings out at you. And uh, that, that creates, what happens is that'll create a uh, instability in the scapula thoracic junction here, leading to a bursitis underneath the scapula. And the muscles at the front are trying to compensate, and so everything just becomes completely off balance, and you end up with more problems. So you want to make sure that you, you know that this is what's going on as well. Plus, this could also indicate an injury to the long thoracic nerve. Um, so it could be a nervous issue, a nerve issue as well. Uh, biceps irritation, like Adam mentioned before, speeds test. If you bring the arm out, supinate the arm, basically resist uh, downward pressure if you have some anterior pain. Jurgensen's test is where you actually try to rotate or supinate the arm with help and extension, and you have biceps pain that indicates some biceps uh, pathology as well.